Hey guys, so my guest I have on today is one of my favorite guests. I've had her on the channel before. It's Pim Jansen. And uh, some of you guys may know her as Mark K's partner, and she appears on his channel quite a bit. Um, but we have some exciting news that we're going to present today. So we're going to be starting up our own healing community, uh, we believe towards the end of February, where Pim will be a coach. And I'm going to be involved in it in some way. Uh, Annabelle from Annabelle's Awareness, who's also been on my channel many times. And we're going to have some other experts coming in uh, to deal with a lot of different subjects. Um, but one major component that we're going to be really looking at in this community is neuroplasticity training and sort of rewiring your mindset and your brain towards healing. When you're in that constant fight or flight stress response, you know, people are going to be in this constant loop where nothing they do works. You could be on every protocol, every diet, take every supplement or drug. Nothing's going to work unless you really heal your mind first and you, you know, prune away those sort of negative neural pathways and rebuild them with healthy, productive ones towards recovering your health. So one component of that that we really get into with Pim today is working on, uh, you know, making the right food choices to recover your health. I think that to some degree, everybody has addictions relating to food, whether it be addictions to carbs or eating too much or whatever. I always say that there's two things that, um, that we need to overcome when it comes to um, fixing our health. And that is a being aware of what the problem is. So getting to the root of the problem and then B actually adhering to what we know works best for us. Now, of course, there's a lot of trial and error in that, but the adhering part is the problem that I've always had the problem with adhering to the right diet, adhering to the right lifestyle choices. Um, and all these different healing modalities that I know work super well for me, but employing them in, in a way that works as a routine on a daily basis and um, having the drive to do that is where my problem exists. So that's why I had this idea to start a community so we could all build this together, build these healthy routines together, work on our mindset you know, get out of this sort of constant state of stress and upright regulated nervous system that's preventing us from healing ourselves. So I really hope that uh, some of you will benefit from this talk I had with Pim today. And we're super excited to, um, to, you know, sort of get into this, this community a little bit more with you guys in the future. Um, we're obviously going to make some more videos about this and, and discuss it a little bit more, but, uh, yeah, let's get into it. Thanks so much for watching guys. We were talking about, you know, what, what is preventing a lot of people from being able to heal their condition, right? Whether it be like a gut condition or autoimmune or chronic pain or whatever it is, there are certain factors in place that are really stopping us from healing. You know, a lot of people try everything and nothing seems to work. And I think that a huge component to that definitely is food addictions. Um, so I know with yourself, you've dealt with a lot of, um, I guess, sort of carb addictions in the past. And I was hoping that you could first start getting into what methods you employ to help overcome that. Okay. So I'm treating it as if it's like an emotional eating disorder because if we dial it back to what it actually is it always comes down to treating the the cravings because it's not about the food that you're eating if you are on like a very low carb diet you're not eating a lot of sugar and other stuff it's never going to be about the food for some people the addiction goes away when they go low carb and if that's you then you don't have an uh, an emotional eating disorder of any kind but for everyone who is low carb and they still have a lot of cravings, yes, there might be something like um, a gut microbiome dysfunction or imbalance or something like that, but we can still use the same techniques. So 
if you can get rid of it with food, what I do is that we are always looking at identifying all the, I talked about this the last time, I think all the triggers. And when we have, when we're getting triggered, we are actually having thoughts about the food, which are not very helpful. And these will create the cravings that we have. So the things that I work with is that we change our thinking, the thoughts that we are having, and we are learning how to process emotions. And a craving is just an emotion. So we just go through a few steps where we acknowledge that we have the craving. We accept that the craving is going to be there because this is um, a biological thing that we have. Everyone has it. It's just that people with food addiction, for them, um, we have overstimulated our brains. So now we need more dopamine than someone who's not addicted to food. So we would just want it and crave it a lot more than people who are not addicted to food. And we just dial that back to let the dopamine reward system kind of go back to basics, <laughs> go back to the baseline and start functioning the way that it does for a normal person while we're also changing our thinking about that. And this is all connected to like a stress response in the same way that when we are having a lot of negative thoughts, we are going to have a body that is in a high stress environment. And if we then sit and we don't want to feel those emotions, we are going to be a lot more stressed about it. So literally the techniques that I'm using to treat food addiction, you can use for any stress condition as well. Yeah, and I, I think it's, you know, we are in this constant reward system now, right? This is the way sort of everybody eats, including myself. I'm not judging anyone, but um, I know with myself, you know, I have such severe gut issues. A lot of people I speak to have intestinal permeability and you're going to get more histamine type reactions. When you get those histamine type reactions, your anxiety goes up huge. And that's mm. for me when the binging really starts. So when I feel that urge coming on to binge, what can I do to get myself out of that headspace? Like, how do I overcome that? Because for me, it's so hard not to binge, and whether it be on carbs or anything, even if it's like healthier foods, if you're eating steak or salmon or something like that, like it just could be too much, right? So mm. what what is like something I could do in that moment when I'm feeling that craziness starting to stir in my head, I need to eat something, I need to eat something. What can I do in that moment to alleviate that? So there are a couple of things. It obviously depends on if you've been doing any of this work before, but the first thing that you need to work on is awareness so that you are aware of what is happening. And I think you are, because you think like, when I do that, I notice that the cravings are coming on. So this, when you have this win of opportunity to stop it, that's kind of the first part, just recognize when that happens. And what I would recommend is that you are very clear on the reason for why you do not want to binge in this moment or like at all, why it is that you want to stick with your diet and sort of dial in on an emotional level and connect with that reason, because that is going to help you to refocus on something that you want rather than something that you want to avoid. And in this moment, it's going to be very, very strong because your brain is just going to be like, oh my God, we need we need lots of dopamine so we, that we can feel better because right now this feels really uncomfortable. But if you can connect with the reason for why you don't want to go ahead and do that at the same time as you're like, okay, I know what to do. I have committed to this practice before I eat anything. I'm just going to sit with that craving and feel it, which is the same thing as allowing an emotion. So how you do that is just you connecting with your body and you feel what's going on in your body. And I think I said this the last time, but for me, I, it always starts in my jaw. So I get a little bit of tension and I start drooling like a dog. It's like I'm salivating. And then it's, I get tension the whole way down here, like where the food would literally go. And it's just like tense. It might be buzzing a little bit. And you just start. The best thing is actually to write it down because when you write it down, you emotionally connecting from it, disconnecting from it, sorry. So you just get it down on paper. You focus on the sensation in your body. So it does a couple of things. It sort of distracts you a little bit from obsessing about the food that you wanted to eat. And 
it allows you to kind of take a step back, almost like watching yourself do this, because when you get it down on a piece of paper, whatever, you can just read it back. And it sounds a little bit silly. <laughs> if I'm if I were to read like, oh, I had tension in my jaw and I started you know, salivating and then it was like buzzing the whole way. You could just ask your question, stop the question, like, why would I need to eat because of that? It's just a sensation in your body. It doesn't matter. It's nothing that will ever force you to eat. So when you can disconnect from that emotionally, because when you're emotionally connected to it, it's just like, oh, I need to eat. <laughs> so we need to sort of get out of that emotional connection for a little bit so that we can um, engage the prefrontal cortex and just go with what we actually want, which is, I want to not binge right now because whatever your big reason is or because any reason. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's more so like tapping into a, a rational state of mind. And I, I know that you've, you've taught this a lot before in terms of sitting with that discomfort. Mm -hmm. Like how, how long does it take to reverse this process for the average person? Well, how long is a piece of string? <laughs> yeah. I, I would say it's not about the length of time. It's about the, the, uh, the number of allowed cravings that you allowed yourself to have. So right. one thing that I do with everyone in my program is that the goal is to have 100 allowed cravings because I think 100 is a really safe number when you've done it and practice it 100 times. I, I can't imagine that someone would be like, oh, I'm just going to go and binge my face off. It, it yeah. just won't happen when you practice that many times. So if you can get 100 allowed cravings in in a couple of weeks, then it could just take a couple of weeks. If it takes you 10 weeks, fine. Then it takes 10 weeks. So I think it's more about the quality of the sitting with the craving because in the beginning, it's you're going to mess it up. It's not going to be that you are able to allow it every time. Sometimes you are going to try and sit with it and it's going to turn into resistance or avoidance in, or something else. So even if you have done it a hundred times in the beginning, maybe 70 of those, we're not allowing it. So that's why it might seem a little bit slower in the beginning, but once you start getting it, and it's just about practice, keep practicing until you get it. Because when you get it, it's like something switches in your brain. And it's going to be so much easier for you to do it um, in an allowing way, like every single time that you're doing it. Right. And it's like, you know, I know just for myself, it's like that reward system shifts from food to feeling good. <laughs> right. That mm. is like feeling good yeah. is the reward. Right. And that's yeah. something that, you know, I think that a lot of, a lot of us are sick, you know, a lot of us in this place yeah. where we have extreme cravings, it's because our mental health isn't up to where it should be. Right. Okay. And that could take some time. It could take a, a bit of rewiring of your brain, so to speak, uh, for that to, to finally take effect. But there, do you prescribe a specific diet then? Like what foods are best suited towards, I guess, or what diet is best suited towards, I guess, getting over cravings, I guess, in general? I mean, in general, I work with like keto or carnivores because that's the way that I'm eating. And that's the way that, I mean, I think that's the best diet for health. And I also think that that is the best diet to get rid of like the physiological cravings. So that makes it easy to not have them. And when I say physiological cravings, I'm talking about uh, cravings that come from, you know, insulin or, and other or hormones that are um, getting out of whack when you're eating a lot of carbs. So we just get rid of that component, but the emotional cravings are not going to go away. So that's, that's what I usually work with. So Pretty much every single client I have is low carb in some way. And I recommend low carb as a broad diet. If someone wants to have fruit, if someone wants to have something else, it's completely fine. We can deal with that. It might create some of those physiological cravings for some people. But if you are kind of accepting that as a consequence of you eating that food, you can still work with it. 
Okay. So like, so like th- people don't necessarily have to be like 100% strict carnivore then they could no. still incorporate some carbs and stuff and, and still be able to manage it. It's not like if they just, it's not like, you know, having some alcohol, right? Like you can't just have one drink. Like you could have a little bit of rice or something like that once in a while and still manage it. Okay. Is that, is that yeah. from what you've seen in, in your experience? Absolutely. And I, I, I mean, everyone is different. So for me, I need to have some carbs every now and then. Otherwise I get like migraines and headaches for weeks. And I don't like rice and I I eat rice just because that's my medicine. That's how I look at it. So that's a mindset thing. It's like, I don't think about it as eating carbs and they're bad because they have a purpose in my diet. They are there because they will make me feel better. And um, it's maybe 30, 40 grams. It's not a huge deal. But even if you were a high carb person, you could still do this work. It's probably going to be a lot harder work for you to go through because you're going to have the the blood sugar issue. But it's still doable. And you can still learn that. And you will probably be a mind control ninja by the end of it if you're eating a very high carb diet and practicing this. (laughs) So diet isn't the be all and whatever the saying is <laughs> and or yeah. it's diet is just there and we just work around that because it isn't about the diet in general for most people okay and do you think what how does fasting play a role in this because a lot of people i speak to with uh perhaps um disordered eating or um, or just even, I, I mean, you could sort of kept maybe even throw just the standard American diet as disordered eating, right? <laughs> um, but uh, how would how would fasting play a role in that in terms of, you know, maybe being a good thing or, or a negative thing in terms of trying to deal with cravings? I mean, do you, do you have any thoughts on that? I have many thoughts on that. And I'm really glad that you asked that. So Two things. So the first one I want to mention is that some people are using it to get out of binges. And then when they come back, it's just like, oh my God, I've been so good. I have been fasting for three days and then they go on the next binge. That is not a healthy relationship with the fast or with the food. So that still needs addressing. But that doesn't mean that the fasting is necessarily evil in itself. Some people tell me that Fasting is really great for me because I don't have any cravings when I'm fasting. And this is really interesting because what you can do then is when you are fasting, just pay attention to how you are looking at food, like what you're thinking about food while you're fasting, because this is what is actually shifting. It's like you have clear boundaries. You have decided that I'm not eating anything for however long I'm going to fast. So it's not even an option anymore. And all of a sudden, your brain stops craving it. But when you're not fasting, it's like you're playing with fire all the time. You're like, well, maybe I can have a little bit of, you know, cupcakes or just one bite of this or whatever, because you don't have any clear boundaries around the food. So I always encourage everyone to have a food plan, however strict or not strict they want it. My food plan is just, I have a mental list of the foods that I eat on a regular basis. Anything that is not on that list, I don't touch without having, you know, plan for it in advance. And that way I can eliminate a lot of cravings because I don't have to debate with myself every day whether I should eat it or not. I already know that there are no foods in the gray zone. It's all either black or white. And when I want to eat the, the, the black stuff, the stuff that I'm not eating regularly, then I decide that beforehand so that there is no drama or giving into cravings because that's what will create this craving cycle and get you to crave even more and more and more. So it's not like if I coach someone and they want to have some carbs every now and then, we can teach them how to do that. It's very easy. They just say, okay, tomorrow I'm going to have some ice cream. Okay, cool. Then we can do that guilt-free. We don't feed the addiction. We're just eating a food if we even want to call it food, but we're just eating something that we not don't normally eat. And then we're done. Then we go back to what we did before. So having those clear boundaries in your brain is a really good idea. And people are struggling with that when they're not fasting. And then when they're fasting, it's just like, yep, I'm obviously not eating because I'm fasting. 
So just get some clear rules about what you want to do when you're not fasting and stick with them. It sounds find, easy. No, I know. I find in my case, I mean, it's not always easy to fast, but in my case, I, mm. I do find that when I fast, it's like, it's just an easy switch in my brain where I'm just like, okay, now I have control over things, right? Yeah. A lot of times I will binge after that's the problem. But, and I do see that with a lot of other people as well. But I find that it, there is some assertion of control there that is is really good for sort of developing, you know, your ability to to manage the cravings over time. Yeah. But you just have to be able to control it when you actually eat as well, um, if that makes sense. But so I think in, in the carnivore space, everybody's so focused on diet, right? What should I be eating? What time should I be eating? Blah, blah, blah. But a lot of times, like people will sort of overlook the other pillars of health. You know, obviously, there's a lot more that goes into health than just eating, right? So, yeah. are there things that you recommend to people or other modalities of healing that you recommend that you find are of, of great uh, or, or confer great benefit to your clients? Like circadian rhythm, follow that because that if you, if you, don't you're going to have more inflammation in your body naturally um i love something that i love that i don't do enough is called thermogenesis okay you gotta um, explain that <laughs> <laughs> so i i need to actually some people do it by just going outside with very little clothes when it's cold outside i can't really do that because my body doesn't respond very well to those kind of things but if I do like a cold immersion in the cold or cool bath or something, I get amazing recovery. And this is actually my number one biohack that works the best for me of all times. I did it for several weeks back when I lived in the UK. And I think I did it six days per week for half an hour. And it wasn't even like, it wasn't an ice bath. For me, it was just, it was I can't even remember. I started on 23 degrees, I think, and just Celsius and then just worked down to maybe 16 or something. So it wasn't even super cold, but I felt like I could go to the gym every day and push out like a, a personal best in the gym every day. I was doing Olympic weightlifting at the time. I had so much energy. I My deep sleep increased. Like Everything recovery wise was just like ramping up and I felt great. So that's something that I recommend, uh, you know, as a person, <laughs> not as a professional, because we don't do that in my program. Um, but there is also the other coin, which doesn't work for me because that can trigger my headaches. But you can do like soreness and stuff. I think that's probably good as well. Or infrared uh, light therapy. Uh, grounding will reduce inflammation. And there are grounding sheets that you can get to you at, if you don't do anything else. At least you can sleep grounded or just take off your shoes and go out outside barefoot for a few minutes in the morning. Then you get a double whammy. You get the, the morning light in your eyes and you get the ground at the same time. Um, you were mentioning meditation before. I I don't meditate myself, but I do. I have a practice of doing like cleaning out my mind pretty much every day and doing some self so that's a form of it's not a meditation but it's just allowing me to clean out my brain so just getting rid of all of these excessive thoughts that are just spinning around on the hamster wheel in your head all the time can be a really good thing whether you want to meditate or do some journaling or however you get rid of that just do something like that and I also like having like deciding how you want your day to go like what's the focus today if you are someone who is chronically ill and you are in a lot of pain, for example, like what, what other thing can you focus on today that is going to make you feel better? And just pick something. Maybe it's just like today I'm just going to appreciate a few things in my life. And that will give your mind a little bit of a relief from focusing on the pain and discomfort that you're constantly in. And just give you a little bit of like feel good hormones <laughs> in the moment. And obviously exercise, great, um, all of those things. Um, I can't even think right now. What else do we do? Yeah, yeah well, you know, I'll, I'll say this. Um, I The way I look at it is this, okay? 
And this is coming from somebody who's been trying to heal now for six years. And Mm -hmm. what the conclusion I really came to, and I've talked to so many people in this space, in the sort of chronic illness space, where they've tried everything. They've tried herbs and antibiotics and every protocol and going to sweat lodges and, you know, any, any kind of voodoo medicine herb or whatever could be taken, they took it and nothing ever worked for them. In fact, everything usually would actually make them feel worse. Mm -hmm. And there comes a point where it's like, okay, I give up what the hell is going on here. And what I really came to learn is that when you're in this constant state of stress, you're in a constant state of fight or flight mode, it is impossible to heal. You're Mm -hmm. constantly going to going to be in a state of inflammation your nervous system is going to be constantly upregulated. Um, you know, you're not going to get the kind of sleep you should get. You know, if you have that, um, you know, the, the type of chronic fight or flight limbic system type injury, your digestion is not going to work. Your vagus nerve is going to be impaired. I mean, there's so much that goes into it. And I guess this is sort of as a good time as any, but um, we're actually going to be starting a, a community um, of, of, for, working on these different modalities of healing, uh, where you're going to be a coach as, as part of this and working on a lot of different mindset components. Right. And yeah, including a lot of those other different things that we mentioned, like meditation and visualizations and, um, getting guest speakers to come on in, in their areas of expertise. And so it's something that like, I'm really excited about, because I really think that people need this kind of continuous support that sure. they're not really able to get just through a regular practitioner, you know? Um, and it, I think that you really need to build a community of like-minded people. Right. So, um, so I guess that's where, where you come in is, is you're going to be coaching a lot in terms of overcoming these negative thought patterns and creating healthy ones. Mm-hmm. And when you typically take people along along that path of sort of rebuilding their brain in a way, yeah. What is like what is like the first place that you start at with that? Is there any anything like do you have a protocol where okay, this is what we need to address first and then keep it, you know, sort of like an organized plan? Not really, because I'm I'm doing coaching, so literally it's very individual where okay. different people need to start but what we see very i mean you will notice you you probably already know for you it's like we have a pattern that shows up everywhere so it doesn't really matter where you're starting because you're going to address all areas of your life if you address one because you have we are we are creatures of habit so whatever we're doing in one area of our lives we're probably doing that in every single area of our lives so Literally, I just start with asking, like, what is the problem? And then we just pick something and yeah. work on that. And that will reveal a lot about what's going on. Yeah. I think a lot of it is is helping people identify what the root of their problem is, which a lot of people aren't aware of. Yeah. And then I think, and then also making sure that they develop a productive routine in place because i could tell you myself i and i'm not saying that i'm an expert or i know better but i've been doing this for a long time i've researched every rabbit hole and everything and i've come to learn for myself what works best and what doesn't now adhering to that is a different story right and that's where i've came to you for help before and i think a lot of people are coming to you for help because i think they know what to do it's just adhering to it and mm-hmm. getting that kind of support that you need to to get through this because it could feel like a very lonely journey you know it, it it's it's it I, I know just for myself it feels like you know i'm really in this alone it feels like it feels like no one really understands what i'm going through and um it's very hard to to manage this on your own so do you yeah. do, do you, I know that you're in your programs, you have a very community based approach in your coaching as well. And where do you see that coming in as, as sort of a driving factor in terms of people 
being able to manage their food addictions or um, or just as a sort of like a healing practice in, in general? Well, I think the community aspect is important because so many people crave community and we don't get that. It's just part of one of the human needs that we have. We we want to be around other people. And since a few years back, we're not able to do that as much in real life, which is, for me as an introvert, it hasn't like <laughs> affected me at all. But a lot of people, they're not like me. So and even when we do that, a lot of people don't understand where we're coming from with the eating disorders or, you know, food addictions or whatever, because either they are in denial or they they don't have it or they don't even want to think about it. So in the Facebook group that I have, we, we I have a lot of people that have gone through my challenge and they just take that and they are able to continue working on that because there are still several people in there. So even if I'm not actively doing the challenge anymore, it's like the environment doesn't change and they have seen these other people. They've been doing the same work. They've been sharing their homework with each other and their journey through actually working through this. So they can just stay there. And obviously I'm there as well to help them if they have anything. And we do come together every weekend on a Zoom hangout and just talk. And I think this just makes people feel like they are part of something and it makes them feel good. It makes those, you know, the, a bit of dopamine and serotonin and all of like the brain chemicals that makes you feel good. You will get that when you're actually in a community of people where you feel like you belong. So that I think that is a huge part. It's just helping uh, along the way. It's helping you to, uh, what's the word? It's helping you to have a different focus because there's something else in your life that actually makes you feel good that matters to you now. Rather than sitting and feeling like you're the only one, it doesn't matter, everyone else is doing it. But now you can see that there are other people in the same situation and maybe they have overcome it. So it just helps you believe that you can do it as well. Do you think that it's something that everyone can benefit off of? Because, you know, this is just my view. I really think that like pretty much everybody has disordered eating to some degree. Now, obviously there's varying degrees of that. There's people like me who eating sometimes all I could think about is food 24 hours a day. A lot of people don't have it to that degree, but I think to some degree, everybody has their addictions. Everybody has their cravings. Everybody binges their portion sizes. I mean, we see it everywhere. I mean, just walking around here in the U S I mean, everybody's overweight, right? So mm -hmm. do you think that, do you agree with that? Do you think that most people have some varying degree of disordered eating? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I, it's, there's no doubt in my mind that most people, and I wouldn't go so far to say everyone, but most people actually do have some sort of <laughs> disordered eating, but yeah. they're not aware of it because it's it's like the norm in society. So we think that it's normal, but just because it's normal doesn't mean that it's a healthy way of eating. So wherever you go, there has to be something that you can put in your mouth, which is crazy. When I was young this is going to reveal my age maybe <laughs> you could get together with people and just hang out like now no one gets together without having something to eat or drink it's just like we can't see each other unless we have food or drinks on the table it's like we need that to feel the connection so it wouldn't be like anyone would ever go and meet a friend at the library where you can't eat and drink and eat something just wouldn't do that it feels wrong so that is just social conditioning and I, I like to call them thought errors because we believe that they're true that this is what we need to do but it really isn't so I just want to add a little part to that people who are not addicted to food they still probably most likely have a hint of addictive behaviors in some other area of their lives and this can be just excessive scrolling on your phone or watching Netflix, uh, you know, binging on Netflix or whatever it might be. So it might just turn up in some other area of your life as well. So I absolutely think that one of the big things that we have moved away from is community. It's like the society that we live in is pretty much 
you have to do this and that and that to be part of our society. Otherwise, we will cast you out. <laughs> and yeah. I really don't think that that is fostering an environment where we actually genuinely care about each other. It's just people are just feeling resentful and pretty much try to take what they need rather than being giving. And that's just not a very healthy environment to be in. So when you finally enter a community where people are just trying to help you, it's like, yes, this is what I'm made for. This is what I needed. Because I think that that is how we have evolved. We have evolved in small groups of people where everyone takes care of everyone. Everyone helps each other out. And that it's pretty much non-existent in our current environment. So I think that plays yeah. a pretty big role as well in our behavior. Yeah, I could say from my own experience dealing with my chronic illness that it, it sort of feels like a lot of times like you're in the Wild West. And, you know, when you're dealing with all these practitioners, and this is just from my experience, I think a lot of people I speak to feel this way that everybody's trying to make money off of you, right? And everybody's trying to sell you stuff. And there's really a lack of that caring component involved. And I think, again, that's why the community is so important. And feeling good in community is the reward system that we should yeah. be following instead of it always being about food, right? Yes. I think that if I could pick one thing, you know, that the board system is based on now, it's food or material possessions, right? Mm -hmm. And that people have really devolved into this sort of, I don't know, this sort of negative society that, that we live in now that's just chronically ill, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, it would, it'd be nice to get back to that, you know, and sort of live free it's, it's just just that freedom again of having to not having to constantly be rewarded all the time right yeah absolutely yeah okay pim um yeah so that that was great uh, i appreciate you coming on and uh, i'm really looking forward to starting this community with you and um you know getting people on the healing track is there anything else you wanted to add at all before we go yeah, I actually wanted to say that because you brought up a really good point. Like all we want to do is like we want to get the rewards from food or material possessions. Mm -hmm. And this is where you might want to start questioning yourself if you're thinking like I can't afford actually getting help. Like where do you where does your money go? Do you have like lots of crap in your house that you don't need that don't doesn't give you any sort of satisfaction or joy in life why do you spend your money doing that rather than getting the help that you need to actually feel good mentally we are so resistant to getting this help a lot of the time it's like well there is nothing that i have like i don't have a physical thing to show for where i've invested my money never mind that i'm gonna feel like great so I think a lot of people need to start changing the mind shift around that. If you want to feel great and you can't do it on your own, what is it that is stopping you from actually investing in yourself? And it doesn't have to cost you several thousands of dollars. Some programs are more expensive depending on how much help you need. But the, I know that Scott's intention is not to make this project you know, into one of those expensive things. So maybe that's where you could start or something similar. But just think about where do you spend your money and does it actually make you feel better? I think yeah. that's a very important thing for you to think about because we often just sit there and like, oh, but I can't afford it. That is your mindset and it needs fixing. If you want something really badly, what is it that you're afraid of? Because often it's like, I'm afraid that I have to put some work in and that scares me. Then you need to work through that and then just do it because it's going to be so worth it. Anyway, Pim. Okay. Well, that's great. Well, thanks so much for coming on today. I, and I really enjoyed this sort of impromptu uh, discussion that we had and um, we'll get you on again soon and um, discuss the community a little bit more. And yeah, thank, awesome. thank you again. Appreciate well, it. Thank you. Um, okay. You're welcome. <laughs>